I want to start off talking about the trade war with China. It certainly has had a huge impact on North Carolina farmers. What are you doing now and what do you plan to do to help them in such a tough situation they're facing? We're beginning to see uh, China buy more and more and more uh, American agricultural goods and, th and that's a good thing because we need it right now. We spent a lot of time in the Department of Ag uh, with China. Uh, in fact, they had become our number one export destination before the trade war started. But we have maintained those contacts uh, even during the trade wars to be able to get back in there when uh, we need to. Uh, as soon, I can assure you, as soon as this coronavirus breaks or we have a vaccine, and I feel safe with my international marketing team being back on airplanes and traveling around the world. We'll be back in China again, uh, freshening the relationships that we've had with China over the years. China tobacco has actually come back now into the tobacco market, uh, which is a very good shot in the arm at a time when we really need it. So. Uh, we'll be back out there to uh, develop these international markets, not only China, but uh, we cultivate markets all over the world. Uh, the European continent is a huge market for our sweet potatoes in North Carolina. We've worked years to uh, get those relationships and, and we're going to continue to do it. And certainly the, the coronavirus and COVID have made it very difficult no matter where in the world you're trying to trade with, correct? It has. Uh, we, uh, you know, we travel the world over. I've led, I don't know how many trade missions to different parts of the world, but with COVID, uh, we have stayed off of the airplanes. We've curtailed the travel and everything we've done has been virtual uh, and, and it works. Uh, we've learned a lot from COVID uh, through uh, virtual marketing, but I don't think that replaces relationships that you build uh, over time and in in-person contact, particularly in the Chinese or are people that do appreciate that in-person visit, whether it be us traveling to China or China coming here. Weather, another big factor that has certainly affected our, our farmers and growers, whether it's storms or flooding. Um, what are you doing and what do you plan to do to mitigate that? Well, after Hurricane Florence and uh, Tropical Storm Michael, I went to the legislature and got $240 million in disaster relief money for the farmers of North Carolina. And I'm so proud that the department got that money out there timely. Uh, and uh, many, many people have, have told me and told people in the department without that, they probably would have been broke and couldn't continue to farm. So we did our best to mitigate that. I've dealt with uh, the Department of Agriculture in Washington and the administration on uh, federal payments to our farmers here in North Carolina, and uh, it was quite a feat to get tobacco included in some of these uh, programs because of the Doggett Amendment that dates back to the 1990s. Uh, so we've done that, but what we need is we need good weather and good commodity prices so farmers can make a, a living selling their crops. Uh, no farmer wants to stay in business by visiting the mailbox, but it's been necessary under the circumstances but between the weather, uh, the trade wars, the tariffs, uh, lack of foreign markets. Uh, it's been tough uh, and we're not out of the woods yet, but we're going to continue to work uh, to help farmers uh, get back on their feet. We've got, uh, the department's got some grant programs going on right now with COVID money. Uh, one is to increase uh, slaughter capacity in our small and medium sized uh, facilities in North Carolina. We want to increase that capacity so that our farmers can market their products directly to the consumer and it's been properly inspected uh, in uh, a slaughter facility packaged with their label on it uh, that's meat handlers. Uh, when I came into office, we had, I think, five meat handlers in the whole state of North Carolina. Today, that figure is over 1,100. So that's become a big business for especially small farmers. Uh, we've got another program to help dairy farmers right now. We've got $2 million that uh, will be made in direct payments from the state to help them because of COVID. Uh, they had to dump milk. Uh, the supply chain was totally disrupted, so we're going to help them. And then we've got another program that's $375,000 to help $750,000 
to help uh, our small farmers markets across North Carolina that were impacted by COVID. Uh, many of them couldn't open uh, in the spring of the year because of local ordinances. And so they've been impacted. They've had to uh, purchase PPEs, uh, had to do all kinds of things with limiting space. So we're gonna help them too. It's, uh, all of this is designed to get us through COVID and get us back to uh, better weather. You mentioned the meat processing plants. That also has been a huge challenge just in, in terms of worker safety. What have you done there? It is, uh, it's been a challenge. I, we saw the, uh, the meat shelves in the grocery store empty for a period of time and none of the regulatory authority for meat, these large meat processing plants falls with the Department of Agriculture. But what we know is that it impacts all of agriculture and we certainly cannot uh, have uh, the processing of our protein without workers and without them feeling safe. So what we've done in the department, we've been very proactive working with uh, the companies, uh, kind of a third party go between between the companies and DHHS, local health departments. and. We work with DHHS to set up a uh, voluntary assessment program where we have a team go in and look at the plants and see what can they do to uh, be in compliance with CDC guidelines. And I think that's been a huge success uh, from where we started to where we are now, it's a big difference. And, and workers have gone back to work. Uh, we have protein on the shelves and the grocery stores. So I think from that standpoint, we've done what we can do. You know, a lot of people who move into North Carolina and don't really know our history may not realize that agriculture are among our largest industries in the, in the state, a multi-billion dollar industry. Talk to me a little bit about that and what some of our biggest commodities are. Well, agriculture and agribusiness is the largest industry in North Carolina. It's currently at $92.7 billion of economic impact. And we're still growing. Uh, I think we'll get to $100 billion shortly with some of the things that we've done uh, to set the stage for the future. Uh, we once were a tobacco state. Uh, basically, every farmer grew tobacco, and it was the staple that uh, let people stay on the farm and educate their children. But with tobacco declining, we have become a very diverse agricultural state. Uh, tobacco was still the number one uh, valued crop grown out of the ground, but we also have now a huge poultry industry that is the number one agricultural industry, a huge hog industry that is the uh, second largest in the, in the country, uh, and we have developed a uh, sweet potato industry that is the number one sweet potato producing industry in the, in the country. Uh, we've done that by uh, marketing sweet potatoes to people that maybe never thought about eating a sweet potato except uh, at Thanksgiving. Uh, and we've also done it with international markets, uh, particularly Europe. And uh, it makes me very proud to go to Europe that far away and see our got to be NC logo in a grocery store over there and it says North Carolina sweet potatoes. Uh, it makes me very proud. We're trying to do that with many commodities all across the world, and, and we're being successful in doing that. Uh, you mentioned tobacco growing. I can remember a couple of decades ago now, it's been just about uh, how a lot of um, our tobacco growers switched over to grapes for wine. Um, some may be thinking today, well, if they ever legalize marijuana, maybe I'll try that. Would you support legalization, whether it's recreational or medicinal in the state? And it, if it did happen, do you have any sort of uh, long-term plans of how you would help those farmers transition? I do not support the legalization of marijuana, uh, but it's not my say. That is a legislative issue. Uh, they would be the ones that would decide whether it happens or not. If it did happen, then of course I'm going to work to help farmers be able to realize uh, benefits of that if it can be done. Looking at what's happened in other states, uh, they've legalized marijuana. Uh, the governments have taxed the, the marijuana, the legally grown marijuana very heavily. So the legally grown marijuana is no, now more pricey than the illicit trade. So now it's going back to illicit trade. So it's not as easy as it would sound. Uh, we did in North Carolina set up a pilot program for uh, industrial hemp. Uh, and I think it's, it, as far as the program, it's been successful, but uh, there were and scrupulous operators that contracted with farmers and never came through. 
Uh, so right off the bat, we overproduced what the market would bear, and now you know there's been a pretty much a collapse of the industrial hemp. Long term, I do think that there's going to be uh, a market for industrial hemp, maybe not as much CBD as there will be for the seeds, the, the fiber, or other uses of the plant, but uh, we have worked very hard in the department on the uh, pilot program. In fact, uh, we rewrote the law uh, after it was passed in the middle of the night one year to make it work and set up this uh, pilot program that does have an industrial hemp commission that is appointed to, to look after how we license uh, the farmers and, and of course now there's a federal program out there and uh, we were in a quandary in North Carolina because we didn't have uh, legislative authorization uh, to do anything basically not even uh, in any program in North Carolina but Congress has now passed a, a part of a uh, package that says that uh, we can extend this pilot program for another year and stay out of the federal program. I could not see any way that we could operate uh, a program, a federal program in North Carolina because it was so restrictive. Uh, their testing requirements were uh, beyond the capability of what we could do in the department. So I breathed a sigh of relief that we can operate again under the pilot program. Generational farming, not as common as it used to be. Uh, that's a challenge uh, to convince you know, your grandson to, to run the farm someday or your son or your daughter. Um, any, th any programs you've thought of doing or are doing to help, you know, inspire these kids to, to be farmers? Well, one of the things that I do personally is I teach a course at NC State with uh, Dean Richard Linton and uh, it, it is invigorating to see the, the smart young people that do want to go into farming. Some of them maybe don't uh, have that access to a generational transfer. But uh, we can help people, uh, young people, find niches to get into. Uh, I think the one thing that is, has helped a lot is with the local foods movement that we have seen in North Carolina and our Got to BNC program. Uh, we have a certified roadside stand program that uh, helps people uh, certify a produce stand that uh, they're growing over 50% of the produce, the produce that they have. So being able to take a small acreage and market directly to the public uh, is something that uh, a lot of younger people are taking a look at and certainly I think can be successful at, but uh, anybody that's ever been uh, in farming understands that it's not a one day co commitment, uh, a one week commitment, a one year commitment. There's good times and bad times and once you make your mind up that you've got to get into it, you're going to get into it, you gotta stick with it. We also have a farmland preservation trust fund in the department where when that generational change does occur, uh, we are pushing and encouraging farmers to put a, a permanent conservation easement on their farm so that it will remain, remain a farm forever. This gives the, the farmer some cash and that generational transfer to maybe help that son and daughter get started into farming. Uh, but the other thing it does, it ensures that we have this farmland in North Carolina to remain the number one industry. We rank number two in the nation as far as the danger of farmland being converted into some other type of use. So that farmland preservation trust fund is hugely important to the future of North Carolina. People will always have to eat. We might as well get our share of the pie, right? Well, that's the idea. Uh, what we know is by the year 2050, we're going to have to have... Uh, 60, 70, even some say 100% more food. So we want to position North Carolina to take advantage of that. 95% of all of the mouths to feed fall outside the United States. So the international marketing aspect of what we do, uh, we hope we'll position our farmers to help feed these mouths that we know are going to be there in the future. Um, switching gears just a little bit, I know that you did issue a statement yesterday after you became aware of some of the threats of violence against your competitor. Um, I do want to get you to comment though in person if you could just in terms of of those threats and your reaction to it. Well first of all my campaign has nothing to do with it. Nobody associated with this my campaign has ever done anything like that. Um, and the, I, have, I have been involved in six statewide general elections now. Uh, ten, if you count the primaries I've been involved in, I have never done a negative ad in all that time, and I won't. 
uh, my TV ads are out right now and they're on our website for anybody to view and, and they're about my leadership ability, the things that I have done and my vision for the future of North Carolina. So any threats like that or should never happen. And, and I said yesterday that they need to stop and stop right now. Uh, I've never been involved in a campaign quite like this one quite frankly, or, and I think it's the times we're living in, but negatives and, and those kind of things are not something I believe in. Do you think it would help if you did remove it from your campaign site, the TikTok video? Well, we didn't post the video. We posted links, the link, the link to the NNO and to the uh, WRL stories. I, I don't think it's so widely spread now, I don't think it would help anything, but I do think that the people of North Carolina need to see the difference between the two candidates. Uh, I'm not a negative person. I don't do negatives. And uh, sometimes you've got to be mature enough. If you made a mistake, say, I made a mistake. I apologize. Uh, please forgive me. And I think that goes a long way. Finally, I want to ask you, you know, as you mentioned, you've done quite a few of these races before. This would be your sixth term. Is that right? It will be my fifth term. Fifth term. But I remember I did not win the first election That's that I right. ran in. That's right. So you've been in this position since 2005. I have. Um, tell me what you've learned over the course of the last 15 years and why you think you're the best candidate to move forward into yet another term. Well, first of all, you've got to be a leader. Uh, I think I have demonstrated that over all the years that I've been here. I have served as the president of the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, which is all 50 states and five U.S. territories. I've served as president of the uh, Southern Association of State Departments of Agriculture. And I also served two terms as president of SURPASS, which is the Southeastern Partnership for Planning and, and uh, Sustainability that deals with the military. Uh, and the problems they have with the uh, encroachment around military bases uh, one of the issues we've dealt with there has been the red cockety woodpecker, uh, red cockety woodpecker that has made a recovery. And quite frankly, North Carolina and our Forest Service has been heavily involved in that, and we're very proud of it. So it does take experience. Uh, I'm a lifelong farmer. Uh, in fact, state law requires that this position be held by a farmer, and it says they shall be a practicing farmer engaged in their profession. I have filed 47 consecutive Schedule Fs with my tax return, which is profit or loss from farming. So you put all of that together, I've got the experience, I've got the leadership experience, and more than that, I have treated this position with the dignity and the integrity that the people of North Carolina deserve, and I'm going to continue to do that. Commissioner Troxler, thanks for your time. Thank you.